Hi there, Neil Clark here from Falkirk Piping. Videos here are free, but we invite you to support our charities. Today's charity is Maggie's Fourth Valley, and you'll see our Just Giving link in the comments below, where you'll also see that we invite you to become a channel member and assist us to keep producing these videos. Today's video is a tutorial on the Peabrock Sir James MacDonald of the Isles Lament. Now we're going to take this Peabrock today <coughs> from Scots Guards Book 2. Uh, perhaps an unorthodox place to source a Peabrock, but there are four uh, very common, nice entry level Peabrocks at the back of the book. I would expect most people to go to either the Peabrock Society or Kilberry book for uh, Peabrock in the first instance. The reason that I quite like the Scots Guards Peabrock is they are written out in full, whereas Kilberry and the Peabrock Society books both employ a series of abbreviations or shorthands for the measurements, which means that a new student to Peabrock has to learn the abbreviation system as well as learning these new uh, embellishments and also the phrasing which is a big big part of Peabrook. The drawback in the guards book is that normally we would talk about most Peabrook in three lines. However due to the typeset restrictions in the guards book a six bar line becomes a four bar line one and the remainder of what should be line one is actually half of line two. And that's a bit of a pest, but it's it's pretty easy to get round. It's only me that gets confused with that, because I'm thinking in three lines, the student's only seeing what's in front of them. So what we're going to do, the other thing about Sir James MacDonald of the Isles Lament is, in theory, at least most Peabrock are held to sort of start fairly easy with the ground, and then get more difficult, as the variations and embellishments start employing more intricate movements. However, most of the hard stuff in Sir James MacDonald of the Isles is contained in line one and that is what we're going to explain first before we go to the rest of the Peabrock. Okay then, so let's play line one and then we'll work our way through it covering any new aspects to a beginner Peabrock player. We have then <laughs> Okay, now the, the first thing, we, we, we're actually going to encounter uh, something which needs explanation straight away, but for a beginner Peabrock player, what I would, the first thing I would suggest is we have lots and lots of things here which we'll explain, but they, to a casual glance they just look like some sort of crazy embellishment and people tend to add grace notes to just wiggle the fingers and hope for the best, but uh, it might take a little bit of a closer examination, but everything's perfectly logical. Uh, the only thing which might appear different from the written music is the length of the note itself. So if we have a look at the, the first main note is a dotted low A there. Before that, we have two parts of the embellishments. We have a G, which has three tails, so is obviously a G grace note. Then we have an E, which is incorporated in the embellishment. And if you have a look at that E, it doesn't have three tails. It only has one, therefore it's shown as a quaver. Now just to complicate matters, we actually hold that E a little more as well. So what we have here then, now this particular movement doesn't have a name. It is a G grace note to a long E and then down to the low A, and it's played. Now, particularly as you're starting the Peabrock off with that, that movement there, 
you have a quite a little, little bit of leeway with how long you play the E. Don't be up there forever, but it's a very long E. Don't translate that movement into this. That's the most common mistake that we get, and it's just muscle memory coming into the fingers. A G grace note to E and down. Now that comes in throughout the tune. You'll see it in bar number two of this line, and it comes in after that as well. After that, still in bar number one, the only things we really have to uh, concentrate on is we have a grip to C from B and a short C followed with another grip to C again. Just make sure that you play the grip as usual but play it correctly. So the full bar should be... Take your time with these embellishments. Don't try and machine gun them. Make sure that every part of the embellishment is correct. Moving on to part number two, or bar number two, sorry. The movement we're concerning ourselves with here is the herein. And herein is the cantarach word for this particular movement. It's one of the cantarach expressions which actually does sound a little bit like the movement itself. Herein. So, looking at, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five notes in bar number two, and the herein consists of the last two notes together. Now, the first note is fairly self explanatory, it's a G grace note to an E, and again, this is a long E. Don't worry too much about it being a crotchet or a quaver, it's a long E. Thereafter, you'll see that the next part of the embellishment is a D. And because it's contained in the embellishment, it is a single D finger. It is not, however, a D grace note. So don't try and play it as a D grace note. If we were to slow down the embellishment, we would play G grace note to the E, through the D, then down to the low A to complete the burrow. I'll give you that again. G grace note to the D E, through the D finger, down to the low A, and a burrow. And the whole thing can be very, very open indeed. Again, the confusion caused in this one is usually because people see that D and they think there's some form of grace note in there. I suppose technically it is a grace note, but it is certainly not a standard D grace note or any other form of grace note. Please just play what's there. Don't put anything extra in. Let's have a look at the herein again. So that's our second uh, Pibroch movement or embellishment. Moving on to par, uh, bar number three here, you'll see that we have the G grace note to the E again, then down to the low A, a B and a grip to C. Then we have a G grace note to the F and some sort of crazy movement after that. That crazy movement is called an Idri. Idri. Uh, and that's the, the E and the Idri part. That's because this movement comes from a higher note, that's the F. If it came from a note below E, it would just be called a DRI. Now, for me, the easiest explanation of uh, an IDRI movement is it's the second half of a Cranluith movement, if you've played a Cranluith already, of course. If you haven't, well, that doesn't really help, does it? But coming from above, where on the main note of F, the movement itself consists of E, A, F, finger only, A, and finishing on an E. So 
So you can try that a few times. Uh, please don't rush it. It's, again, it's much, much more important just to get that movement correct. Uh, I personally feel that it's harder to get a good idri coming from, from above than it is getting the dri coming from below. So let's have a look at that bar uh, by itself. <laughs> Now we come to bar number four, which is probably the most complicated uh, that you've come across so far. It is at the end of line one in Scots Guards 2, but would be at the end of bar four of line one in most other publications. So we've got quite a lot to go through here. Uh, the first thing is, looking at this first embellishment here, we'll see that the embellishment consists of a G grace note. Again, the E doesn't have three tails, it only has one. And again, we can hold that a little bit longer. The second, the third, sorry, part of the embellishment is a D, uh, which is shown as a demi semi quaver. And then we finish on a C. This movement is known as a cadence. A cadence. It's a cadence to C. We will also encounter cadences to B, I think, yeah, we do in this tune and they are just slightly different so we'll, 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 we'll cover them when we come to them. The way that we're going to do this cadence, imagine a rolling down effect so now G grace note to E through the D, now it is an embellishment but because we are just going down to the C from there you can do a full D, we don't do that in the B cadence. G grace note to E, through the D to the C. Don't try and put a grace note on the C, it won't work. <laughs> then, we're down to low A and we then perform a D. So it's the same movement as we've just covered in bar number three, but we're coming from the low A. Let's just combine the cadence, the low A, and the D together. Okay, now I was casting my eyes further down the tune here, but here we have a cadence to B immediately. So the difference between the B and the C is purely the D finger, and I'll show you that just now. G grace note to along E. Now we're not going to C, so we're not going to have a full D this time. G grace note to E, through a D finger only, and then down to the B. G grace note to E, a D finger only, and down to the B. And just be careful you don't cross coming from the D to the B. It should sound... <laughs> Exactly the same uh, structure as the cadence to C, except you're going to the B and it will be a single D finger only. The last thing we need to cover, and I think that's, that's actually covered for the first line, is a throw in D. What's the technical about a throw in D in Peabrook? Well, the first thing is it must be an open throw in D. We don't play closed D throws in Peabrook. And I'll ask you to look a little bit closer at it you'll see that the low G element of the throw is has two bars. It is a semi-quaver as opposed to the normal throw demi-semi-quaver. Now, I'm totally fine with that because I'm always asking people to play a nice big low G anyway. In Peabrock, it's demanded. So... The other thing we do, I'm going to play the bar uh, and... Have a listen to when I hit the low A before the D and the low G in the throw because we're looking for them to sort of echo each other in balance. So we've got... Now, 
that's been quite a long haul and for the first line of a first Fibroch, it sounds like there's a lot to learn uh, and it is but the good news is that you've you've pretty much covered all the technical stuff that there is to to cover uh, I think what we'll do is we'll play the full ground for you and then I'll split the video up a little bit and we'll talk about uh, the, the the other variations and uh, let's just go through the Cranlewith as well. So the ground or the urler of Sir James MacDonald of the Isles Lament. <laughs> Just before we move on to uh, the rest of this tune, if we have a look at uh, in the guards book, we are talking line three, bar two here, and we have a cadence to the C, then it's an, a D up to the E. Now, in other parts of the tune, you may expect. Don't go to the low A, straight from the C to the E G. That's it's 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 a sort of muscle memory thing which will lead you possibly to do that low A before the E G to the C. Uh, however, don't do it. Don't get into that habit. So let's have a look at variation one, uh, the grace note sequence and its phrasing. So on to variation one, and. What I quite like about this particular tune is Variation 1 sets the phrasing for the rest of the tune. Your embellishments are going to change, but this is basically the, the, the tune from now on. Uh, it's, it's a nice variation as well, very, very tuneful. Uh, well, I'll explain what's going on here. Uh, the, the, the first thing to try and get right is the length of the notes. Uh, it's Phrasing is just so, so important in Peabroch and uh, it's the length of the notes that is so important. Uh, what we can talk about moving through here, uh, it goes one, two, and one, two, and one, two, and one, two, and one. So we have, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's phrase number one, which is roughly two bars. Um, the and note, of course, being the, the short note. The grace note sequence is very important here. And you'll see that in, in a lot of variations like this, usually it's sets of two notes here. We have one, two, and, so we have three. Uh, but the, 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 the sequence of the grace notes is very important. 
It'll take you a wee while to get the G E D G E D G E D G E D and then sometimes of course it's two G grace notes in a row so keep your eyes open for that. It will become entirely natural quite quickly and then you, you'll find that you can apply this sequence to other P brock as well. So it doesn't really take much explanation. What we're looking for Remember we talked about lines, so at the end of the first six bars in here, which is the end of line one, we would expect maybe a, a, a slightly subtle pause. Uh, the same at the end of line two, which in Scots Gars two of course is the end of line three. And finally, at the end of the variation itself, we need some sort of pause or punctuation to take us into the next variation, which is the Tor Lewis. Arguably we could also have subtle pauses at the end of each two bar phrase but let's think about the lines in the end of the variations to begin with. So we'll do, I, I don't really think there's much explanation required here, uh, I'm going to play through variation one and then I'm just going to show you what I would expect for the transition as well. Uh, always practice your transitions because we don't want to be getting to the end of a variation or a ground and thinking, oh no, how do we, where do we put this pause note? Uh, establish that first where you're going to put the pause notes. Sometimes you have an option, sometimes you don't. So this is variation one. <laughs> We're into the Terluth there. Now you heard the uh, the low G getting just a little bit extra. That's your pause note at the end of this variation. The final note that's shown, which is your, your connecting note of B, I would really look upon that as a lead-in note to the Terluth variation. So I said I would uh, cover the pauses in this uh, to lead you into variation one. Uh, I think it's good practice to perhaps play the last phrase of the preceding variation into the variation you're going to practice. So we've got... Quite lucky there in that uh, the A at the end of the hearing is a full note, it's quite a long note, so you can rest on there just a little bit before launching into variation one. And don't try variation one too quickly. Okay then, let's have a look at the Torluith variation. On to the Torluith variation now. Uh, I think everything that requires any possible explanation is actually contained in the first two bars. So... The first thing again, the embellishment is written with the low A, the themal note, uh, is slightly before the, the embellishment. And what's quite good about this particular P Brock is sometimes in uh, Torluith and Cranluith variations, the rule is to get off the Torluith as soon as you've finished it and onto the next themal note. So here, it's quite a useful one for beginners because we actually get to hold on to that low A 
after the Tor Lewis. Now, you can hold the female note for quite a long time. The dog's just joined me, excuse the thumping. Um, and then we, the, the same, it's the same uh, phrasing as one, two, and one, two, and one, two, and one, two, with the two being the Torluith element itself. So the first Torluith is self explanatory. <laughs> Give yourself plenty of time to execute a full and correct Tor Lewis and a long themal note or a long no A in other words will actually help you achieve that. The only explanation that might be required is both in bar two. We have a D Tor Lewis. Remember in the D Tor Lewis we don't perform a D grace note on that. <laughs> Do that again, that wasn't very good. But it's a G grace note to your themal note of D. Low G as usual, but instead of a D grace note, you execute a single finger B grace note down to low G again, and then the E grace note. Then the other final one, which I think this only happens in Pibroch, somebody will prove me wrong. Uh, this, and it also tends to happen at the end of phrases, so that's a little, a nice little aid memoir there that helps you remember it, is instead of finishing the Tor Lewis on the low A, we finish down on the low G. So in this case we're coming from B. The, the best way for me anyway to remember that is instead of going... Just keep that low E finger down and and like I say, what might help you remember this is it's at the end of the very first two bar phrase. So what I would suggest with this is nice long themal notes. Uh, the Tarlois themselves can be very very open, very very deliberate. Do not please attempt to go for very very fast embellishments and that's pretty much it for uh, the Terluith movement. Let's have a look at uh, our transition. So what we're going to do in the transition if you look back at variation one you'll see that the last long note is the low G that is the note we're going to pause on and we're going to use the D grace note to the B as a springboard into the Terluith. <laughs> We're into the Cranluth. Uh, another reason I quite like this uh, Sir James MacDonald is perhaps a first Pibroch is yeah we have a really hard first line 
but uh, there's no singling and doubling variations, it's pretty much straight through. So let's have a look then at the Cranluth, which will require just a little bit more explanation of the Cranluth itself, and uh, then we'll carry on. Finally then to the Cranluth variation, and what I would say for the Cranluth variation is get acquainted with the Cranluth movements before you do this Cranluth variation. Be absolutely sure of the Cranluth and don't be working your way through the variation guessing how you're going to play the Cranluth. So do a few scales on the Cranluth, become acquainted with the movement itself. We're going to touch briefly on how to play the Cranluth, uh, which is Himdandre uh, in Cantarac. I don't use the term because uh, I find that a bit cumbersome. So, the basic movement, the first movement in the tune... <coughs> Is a, conveniently is a low A Cranluth. We'll explain the D Cranluth, which is in bar two, separately. Two ways really of explaining the Cranluth. You can explain it as a Torluth with two extra notes, or you can split it into two halves. I prefer the two halves myself. Um, and the way I would explain that. <coughs> That's your first half of the Cranluth. G grace note to a long low A. The A is, of course, the main note. Close to low G and a D grace note to low G. Thereafter, the action is really on the top hand. It's an E to A, single finger, F to A, and finish on the E. So again, the first half would be... And then... Combined, the one which might cause you uh, a challenge is the F finger. It's not used to operating by itself, and in fact, in piping, it hasn't up till now, up to until you play the Cranluth. Just to explain. The D Cranluth, just as we did with the D Torluth, we don't play the D Grace note in the D Torluth. So here we have the the B Grace note, single finger B, substitutes for the D Grace note. So I would really strongly suggest getting to grips with the Cranluth before attempting any Cranluth variation. Oh, this is a standard Cranluth, by the way. There are three other types, but this is a, a standard Cranluth. Is it a Breivich because it's got two notes after it? doesn't really matter. You're going to play it the same. You're going to play it the same. Uh, long themal notes to give yourself plenty of time to get this Cranluth in. Do not go for exceptionally fast Cranluths. It's much, much better that you get them correct. When you finish the Cranluth, immediately you finish the Cranluth on the E and you jump off to the low A. And note you're going to the low G there at the end of the phrase, just as you did in the Tor Luth variation. Don't play. We need to get right off that. E at the end of the Cranluth there. So if you've been away practicing your Cranluths and you're quite happy with that, then your variation is as follows. We'll start the variation with the last phrase of the Torluth, and at the end of the Cranluth variation, we'll go back into the first line of the ground. Now for the full tune, I'll, this is a long enough video already, so I'll include the link to where you can see the full tune being played and play along with it. 
Så hjertelig godt. Thank you.